Yes, friends, that whistle is your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler. The mystery program that is unique among all mystery programs. Because even when you know who's guilty and you see his every move or know his complete plans, you always receive a startling surprise at the final curtain. In the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. I am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadow. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's the Whistler for tops in entertainment. And for tops in gasoline quality, it's Signal. It takes extra quality, you know, to give you extra mileage. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. So look for the signal circle sign in yellow and black that identifies friendly, independent signal stations from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story. Man on the Roof. Eddie Welch was a young man who enjoyed his work. Yes, he loved every moment of it as he sat before the microphone in the booth high on the roof of Crandall's department store his voice booming out over the public address system, directing the attendance, the movement of the automobiles in the parking area below. Two spaces in aisle four, one in aisle five, aisle six is full, three spaces in aisle seven, four against the wall. Number one, keep the driveway clear. Clear the driveway. Yes, it pleased Eddie to run the lot from his lofty perch on the roof of the department store pleased him to see the movement of the traffic below respond instantly to the sound of his voice. But though he liked it here on the roof, Eddie had made up his mind a long time ago he'd leave this job when the right opportunity came along, something worthy of his talent. He wasn't quite certain just what it would be, a break, a lucky chance, but it would come sooner or later. So Eddie Welch waited, and that break finally came late one afternoon. Aisle one, two, four, six, and eight, full. Two spaces in aisle three, one in aisle five, four in aisle seven, one against the wall. Plenty of room in the overflow. Hello. All right if I come in? Well, well, well. Sure. Sure, come in. I I haven't seen you around the store before. I'm new. The latest addition to the glassware department. Mm. Well, I ought to get around more. If you'll stop leering at me for just a moment, I, um... I have a message from Garcia. Uh, Peggy Garcia, that is. Peggy? Oh, oh, yeah. It's about a date tonight. Something came up, said to tell you she can't make it. Can't, huh? Well, I didn't really think she would anyway. So, I'm a free man tonight. Uh, that is, unless you... Uh... Oh, hold it. Gee, you get ideas fast. Anything wrong in my asking you for a date? Oh, I might be booked for the evening. Okay. Suppose I stop by glassware, say, closing time, and check with you. Well, what about Peggy? Won't she be... She has no strings on little Eddie. No strings at all. Besides, baby, she's engaged. Didn't you know? Oh, I see. Check with you later. Check with me later. You watch her as she walks away and disappears down the stairway. Then your eyes swing back over the parking area. You notice the empty spaces in each aisle. Then as you reach for the mic switch again, something you see stops your hand in midair. Against the far wall, you see two men struggling between the parked cars. You reach for the binoculars and train them on the scene in time to see one of the men fall back. His head hits the car bumper and he doesn't get up. Quickly, the other man jumps into a car, a light green convertible, and drives away. An instant after you've jotted down the license number, you pick up the phone and call downstairs. Operator. Now, this is Eddie Welch on the roof. Look, get one of the store cops out to the parking lot right away. What's wrong? 
And there's a man stretched out on the ground near the back wall. I think he needs help. Hi, gorgeous. I understand the big wheel wants to see me. Well, if it isn't the Romeo of the rooftop. Yes, Mr. Crandall wants to see you, Eddie. Hey, uh, how about doing the town Saturday night? Huh, sweetheart? Sorry. I'll be at the wrestling matches, Junior. You think you'll win? Why don't you drop dead, huh? (laughs) See you later. Oh, come in, Eddie. Come in. Uh, Eddie, this is Lieutenant Davis, Police Department. Hiya, Lieutenant. Hello, Eddie. The uh, Lieutenant has been questioning the boys on the lot about that unfortunate uh, accident this afternoon. Oh, yes. Say, how did the fellow make out? Are you okay? He's dead. Dead? That's too bad. Uh Uh-huh. He was one of our boys. A city cop? That's right. I uh, understand you were the one who first reported the accident. Yeah, I was on the roof. Uh, look, I'd I... say you were in a good position to see what happened, huh? Uh-huh. Only... Only I didn't see anything. I just happened to notice the guy on the ground. As to what happened before that, I wouldn't know, Lieutenant. I wouldn't know. It hit you suddenly, didn't it, Eddie? And then you decided to lie to the police lieutenant. You were about to reach into your pocket. Pull out the slip of paper with the license number of the car on it and place it on Mr. Crandall's desk. He would have been proud of such efficiency, and certainly you would have been rewarded. Mr. Crandall was always eager to help bright, alert employees along. Yes, that could have been your opportunity, Eddie, the break you've been waiting for. But suddenly another opportunity presented itself, a golden opportunity. And that bit of paper bearing the license number of the killer's car stayed in your pocket. So you didn't see anything. Is that right, Eddie? No, not a thing, Lieutenant. Funny, very funny. From the roof, I'd say well, you... The parking area takes in a lot of territory, Lieutenant. I only have two eyes. Sure, sure. Okay, Eddie. That's all. You're excited, aren't you, Eddie, as you leave Mr. Crandall's office, anxious to make plans. You tell yourself you've got to move cautiously. Think it all over very carefully. Your first problem is to contact the driver of that new, expensive-looking green convertible. You think about it for a long time, and it's still on your mind the following day during your lunch hour as you walk across the parking lot with Joan, the girl you met on the roof. Eddie, what are those fellas doing? Uh Uh-huh. Over there. They seem to be Mm. taking down the license numbers. (laughs) That's right. You're new here. And they work for the store. Check the license numbers with the Motor Vehicle Bureau. Find out who the car owners are. Well, what's the idea? Oh, a survey of some kind. Find out where the customers come from. Help select the districts. Their advertising seems to pull the heaviest... Well, what's the matter? Uh, nothing. Nothing. Uh, look, John, why don't you run on ahead? I want to talk to one of the boys. Okay. See you later. Thanks for the lunch. Hi, guys. Oh, hello, Eddie. How's the boy? Fine, fine. Hey, hey, look, do me a favor, huh? I uh, get a license number I'd like to slip into that list. Check it for me. Oh? I'd say... Uh, well, as a, as a baby comes in here regularly, I get to talking to her a couple of times. Very friendly type and very cute. Oh, I get it. She's uh, kind of coy, too. Won't give your name or phone number, but she does have a car and cars have license plates. I got it. Yeah. Sure, I'll be glad to help you out, Eddie. I'll let you know in a day or so. Swell. Uh... Hey, with the right sort of break, does this uh, deal show much uh, promise? Uh, who knows, guys? It might be what I've been waiting for all my life. With the prologue of Man on the Roof, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story. By the Whistler. Since last week's Whistler, you know, your car has aged a whole year. Yes, even those shiny 1948s are now technically last year's models. But after all, the important thing is not the year your car was made, but rather the care it receives. 
That's why if you want your car's performance to stay young, it's so important for it to receive the more thorough, more conscientious service that cars get at independently operated signal service stations. For example, when a signal dealer lubricates your car, he checks against the official factory chart that shows exactly which of Signal's nine specialized lubricants each part should have for long, trouble-free service. Then, just to make double sure not a single part has been missed, your Signal dealer checks the whole job again, which explains why we call it Signal Double Check Lubrication. This is typical of the many little extras you enjoy at Signal service stations. Because Signal dealers, being in business for themselves, have more reason to want to keep your business. And now, back to the whistler. You're not sorry, are you, Eddie? Not sorry about the sudden decision you made in Mr. Crandall's office when you told the police lieutenant you knew nothing about the unfortunate accident that occurred on the parking lot the day the city detective was killed. You didn't tell him that you saw the struggle of the two men between the parked cars, saw the killer ride away in a green convertible, that you had jotted down the license number of the car. No. You have other plans, haven't you, Eddie? Big plans. Then, two nights later, as you leave Crandall's department store, you run into your friend Gus. Hi, Eddie. I say I checked that dame's license number for you. Oh, did you? Swell. Yeah. The uh, car's registered to a guy named Merrick. Alton Merrick. <laughs> Maybe her boyfriend, huh? Too bad, Eddie. Oh, he could be your old man, Gus. Oh, sure. Sure. Who knows? Anyway, that's who the car belongs to. Alton Merrick. It's uh, 100 Weatherby Place. Hmm. Yeah. It's been a nice neighborhood. Uh-huh. Thanks. Thanks, Gus. You've been grand, boy. Just grand. Hello? Mr. Merrick? Alton Merrick? Yes. Who's this? Uh, the name isn't important. I'm just the guy who happened to be around Crandall's department store the day that city cop was killed. Still on the line, Mr. Merrick? Uh, yes, yes. I uh, thought maybe I could do you a big favor, like keeping my trap shut. You follow me? I don't know what you're talking about. Okay, suppose you come around to the Blue Hat Bar tomorrow night, 8 o'clock. I'll be waiting. Why should I come? Be there, pal. The blue hat, 8 o'clock. And wear that same checked coat you had on the other day, huh? Gee, isn't he wonderful, Eddie? Huh? The piano player. Oh, he's terrific. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah. I like this place, Eddie. The blue hat bar. You know something, baby? From the day you walked into my life, things started to break right for little Eddie. Yeah, I... Well, what is it, Eddie? Uh, nothing. See someone you know? No, nobody. Uh, is this seat taken? Uh, no, no, it isn't. Here, I'll take my hat. Thanks. Oh, uh, bartender. Come on, let's go, baby. You're leaving already, Eddie? Yeah, I've seen all I wanted with this place. Come on, let's breeze. Did you see the coat he was wearing? What? The man who sat down next to you wearing that check coat. Oh, yeah, loud, wasn't it? Oh, it shrieked. As you make your way out of the bar, the panic that swept over you a minute ago has left now, hasn't it, Eddie? For a moment, you were frightened when you saw him walking towards you. Merrick, the man in the checkered coat. For an instant, your heart seemed to stop beating as he spoke to you. Then you realized he couldn't possibly know you were the voice on the telephone. That now you knew what he looked like. And that's all you wanted to find out for the present. As you take Joan back to her home, his face flashes before your mind. A cold, hard, brooding face. Square jaw. Dark, heavy eyebrows. A cruel face, isn't it, Eddie? 
and you realize you're going to have to be extremely careful dealing with this man, Merrick. Late the following afternoon, you're on the roof again, directing the flow of traffic in the parking lot below. Three spaces in aisle four, two in aisle five, six in aisle six, three in a... Three in aisle seven. No one seemed five, to notice the break in your eight. voice, Eddie. At that three moment when you saw him four. again, three the man in the check coat, four, the man you're going to blackmail, five, standing six, down there in the lot, six, staring up at you. Three in aisle now seven, as your voice five, drones out over the eight. lot, a thousand Plenty frantic thoughts race four. through your mind, and you wonder if he knows. Then shortly before closing time, you see Merrick again. You're talking to Joan on the main floor when suddenly you're no longer aware of what she's saying. Daddy, what's the matter with you? I thought we were talking. Huh? I said I thought we were talking. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I got sidetracked. You're still that way. Why the sudden interest in our store detective? That's the guy with him that interests me. The guy in a check coat. Oh? Oh, he's gone now. As I was I saying... Say it later, will you, huh, baby? I, I want to ask Ben some. Uh, okay, okay. See ya. How's business, Ben? Oh, hello, Eddie. Business? Oh, it's picking up with me, picking up. Especially around this time of the year. Yeah, all they need is somebody to watch you. Huh? <laughs> Cute kid. <laughs> hey, uh, who was your pal there a few minutes ago? Pal? Oh, him. No pal of mine, that's... <laughs> Not that guy. Well, you seem to know him. I met him in Philly 10 or 12 years ago. Name's Griffin. Griffin? Yeah, we worked the same store. Then he branched out. After that, I lost track of him. What do you mean, branched out? He opened his own office. Heard he turned out to be a private eye. Odd detective jobs were higher. You've heard of the type. <laughs> sure, on the radio. Not quite. This is a bad boy, Eddie. Real bad. Anything for a dollar. <laughs> Sounds familiar. Hmm? Huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I suppose there's guys like that. Ben smiles as you walk away from him, doesn't he, Eddie? He doesn't have any idea what's going on in your mind. Just talk, he thinks. But it isn't that way at all. No, Eddie. You're thinking how smart Merrick is to use this man Griffin for his blackmail negotiation. He almost threw you off, didn't he? making you think that Griffin, the man in the check coat, was Merrick. Another thought occurs to you and sends a little quiver of nervousness along your spine. Merrick must know for certain that you are his blackmailer, Eddie. Yes, and the knowledge could be disturbing enough to make him want to push you off the roof someday. You're anxious now to find out what Merrick himself looks like before you plan your next move. And so that night, you call Merrick's home again. Hello? Mr. Merrick? Oh, yeah. Eddie? Huh? Eddie Welch? You, you know my name? I know quite a bit about you, Eddie. Even what's on your mind this minute. Yeah, yeah, I guess you do. Well, we better get together, talk. Fine, Eddie, fine. Uh... Hat again? Good enough. Be there tonight. Say, 10 o'clock. 10 it is, Eddie. You're running the show. <laughs> oh, yeah. Don't you forget that. Not me, Eddie. You're trembling as you leave the phone booth, but your nerve gradually returns, doesn't it? Yes, Eddie. The long walk through the night air is good for you. It clears your mind. And soon you feel that you're clicking again, able to handle the situation. You reach Merrick's apartment building a good hour before the appointed time. Wait in the dark entrance of a building across the street. It isn't too long before you see Griffin, the private eye, come out, still wearing the check coat. Then he turns, opens the door of a car for another man. You're certain that he's Merrick, aren't you, Eddie? Now you can be sure you're dealing with the right man. You don't have to keep the appointment. You know what he looks like now, and you won't forget. Yeah, another day, Eddie. That's right, Al. 
Well, good night. Good night. Oh, uh, Eddie. Yeah? Uh, I almost forgot. There was a fella hanging around the store. He wanted to be sure when you got off. Oh? Yeah, I told him everybody was working overtime tonight. What did he look like? Mm, heavy set fella. Rough looking. Bushy eyebrows. <laughs> Who? Uh, nobody important now. Thanks. Oh, sure. <laughs> You expect to be followed, Eddie, and you are. And as you also expected, it is Griffin, Merrick's detective for hire, the man Ben thinks would do anything for money. And you know he's working for a man who'd do anything, too. You quicken your steps, hurry down the darkened street. Then as you move past an abandoned building under construction... Hey! Hey, Walt, wait! Oh, I gotta lose him. You turn run into the convenient protective darkness of the building, scramble wildly up a set of improvised stairs, and wait, listening. You start forward again frantically, take another flight of stairs and leaping strides to the fifth floor. At the top, you freeze, almost paralyzed with fright. <gasps> the wall at the outer edge of the landing hasn't been put up yet. And you almost stepped off into space to a five-story fall to the street. Griffin, he's still coming. Okay, brother, you're asking for it. You press back into the shadows. Wait quietly, grimly. But he's slowing up, Eddie, moving cautiously. You want to make him come at you fast. Here I am, Griffin. Come and get me. I'll get you, you little blackmailer. Mr. Merrick... Mr. Merrick, open up. It's annoying, Eddie, that Merrick doesn't answer. Because you're sure he's inside, waiting for Griffin to come back and tell him that you're out of the way. Then from a sound down the hall, you're aware of an elevator stopping at Merrick's floor. You duck back out of sight. Wait nervously until you see who it is that stepped out of the elevator. Merrick. You recognize him, don't you, Eddie? It's the same man you saw with Griffin last night. Hello, Mr. Merrick. Uh, what? I don't believe I've had the pleasure. It isn't going to be any pleasure, Mr. Merrick. I've been pretty slick up to now. You and Griffin. But not slick enough. I'm Eddie Welch. I see. Sure you do. You see plenty. Like lots of dough changing hands, huh? That's what I want, Merrick. And I mean lots of it. You're a tough boy, aren't you? Well, we better talk it over. There's nothing left to talk over. Griffin's dead. What? Uh, an accident. Too bad, isn't it? Don't you think it's a good idea to invite me in? <sighs> All right, Eddie. You know you've got me stymied. Come on in. The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending to tonight's story. Recognize that noise? That was someone breaking a perfectly good New Year's resolution. And here it is only January 2nd. There's one resolution, however, that I hope you won't break. The resolution we made on last week's Whistler to try, just try, signal gasoline in your car. Because seriously, friends, there are real advantages for the driver who powers his car with signal, the famous go-farther gasoline. Mileage, of course, is one of them, but only one. 
For in order to give you such good mileage, today's signal gasoline has to help your motor run more efficiently. And when your motor runs more efficiently, naturally you enjoy more exciting performance in the way of pep, power, and smoothness. That's why you'll find folks with big cars, as well as folks with small budgets, patronizing signal service stations. They've both discovered that in gasoline, it takes extra quality to go farther. And signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. And now back to the whistler. You knew it all the time, didn't you, Eddie? Knew that someday that golden opportunity would present itself. The break you were waiting for, and you'd be sitting on top of the world. Then it came suddenly. Remember, Eddie, that day at the parking lot of Crandall's department store, when you saw the struggle of the two men between the parked cars? saw the killer race away in the green convertible. It was a smart move, wasn't it? Taking down the license number of the car. And a smarter move on your part not to tell the police about it. And now the killer, a man named Alton Merrick, is at your mercy. And as you sit in his apartment, facing the tall, cold-eyed man, you're waiting to discuss a financial arrangement. You know, Merrick, that was kind of cute of you. Sending Griffin around to keep your appointments with me. Wearing that check coat of yours. About the same build, too. At the start, I really thought he was you, Merrick. Didn't know what you looked like until last night when I saw the two of you leave the building. Mm-hmm. You know, sending him around to knock me off wasn't such a good idea, Merrick. Not for your pal Griffin. He, uh, wasn't very smart. You took care of him, huh? Uh, let's say he'd still be here if he hadn't chased me into an empty building. You're a pretty smart boy, aren't you, Eddie? Smart enough to tell the police I saw a gent named Alton Merrick kill that city cop at a fight in the parking lot. Unless Mr. Merrick makes it worth my while to forget it. Got it all figured out, huh? Uh-huh. You're wrong about one thing, Eddie. I didn't send Griffin around to see you. Then who... You see, I've been trying to get Griffin myself for a long time. That's why I came here last night. And you saw me with him. We had a lot of things to talk about. Like what? You see, Eddie, my name isn't Merrick. That was Griffin's real name. Griffin and Merrick were one and the same guy. Same guy? But you... Uh... My name's Kincaid. Lieutenant Kincaid, Los Angeles Police. I'm very glad to meet you, Eddie. Very glad. Let that whistle be your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil and fine quality automotive accessories. Signal has asked me to remind you, to get the most driving pleasure, drive at sensible speeds, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations. It may save a life, possibly your own. Featured in tonight's story were Tom Holland, Lorette Philbrandt, and William Conrad. The Whistler was produced by George W. Allen and directed by Gordon T. Hughes, with story by Steve Hampton and music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Remember, at the same time next Sunday, another strange tale by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.